Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you on your faith journey. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com. Once again, it is great to have you here, great to connect with you today. If you haven't already, take a minute, comment in the comment section, say hi, let us know how you're doing. Also would encourage you, this is a great time to hit share. We're going to go into a message where I hope I challenge you because of what God says through me, and I hope that you find some hope and some encouragement in it. I also would like to invite you to go ahead and go to therescuechurch.com slash notes. You can get the note sheet there. There's not a lot of notes, but I do have the passages on there this week because uh, I'm not using a normal version or one that I would typically use this week. So if you wanted to reference it, you can download it at therescuechurch.com slash notes. All right, so, so that said, I, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you had a great week this week. I know there's a lot going on in the world right now with COVID and all that goes with that. It's been kind of exciting, I guess, in spite of all that's going on, and I, I'm sure there's some some divided thoughts on this, but it's been kind of exciting to see that sports are coming back. I, I'm looking forward to it just as, a, as an escape. I mean, we see that baseball, I, I think their season's kicking off this week. Hockey's coming back soon. Basketball's coming back soon. They're all in the bubble getting ready to play. The NFL sounds like it's going to be going here this fall. It's going to be fun to have that ability to connect with sports, even though it's different than what it normally is. Now, as I look ahead to the football season, I'm, I'm excited. You guys know I'm a Vikings fan. I, I love to cheer for the Vikings. But I'm also a New England pa- Patriots fan and have been, have been for years. I, I started back in oh, late 80s and started cheering for them. And the, the story behind that just kind of goes to that there was no one in the area that was cheering for them in New England at that point. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to pick a losing team and I'm going to start cheering. I'm going to start being a fan. And so while all of the, the kind of like the fair weather fans had dropped off, I decided I was going to start cheering. And I started cheering for them. And for years, it didn't go well. Then they drafted a quarterback named Drew Bledsoe and things started to turn around. Then they got Bilicek as a head coach and put Tom Brady in at quarterback. And all of a sudden, the rest is history and they built the dynasty there. So I've been a fan of theirs for years. And even while some people have, have come and gone on that, I've been a fan. And some people question if I'm just that bandwagon guy, the guy that just jumped on because things were good. The reality is, no, that had nothing absolutely to do with it. In fact, I jumped on because they were bad. And anyway, this is all going to tie in. I'm going to tie it into our message today because the reality is there's some people that are all in when things are good, when they're bad, and when they're everything in between. And then there's the other group that that's there when things are good for the good parts and kind of drops off for the bad. And then, of course, there's the other group of you that are out there that hate New England regardless of how good or bad they are. In fact, I think that some of you hate New England because they're good. But anyway, we're not going to get into that and debate that today. What we are going to do is we're going to go back to the book of James where we've been in these past eight weeks. We've talked in the book of James about how uh, God wants us to live. And James has talked and challenged to those Jewish Christians that are scattered throughout the known world at the time. And he's challenged them with how to live and what their lives should look like. We're now in in James chapter 4, verses 4 through 10. And I know last week we went went to chapter 5, but we're going to go back and and continue in 4 and finish some of what we didn't cover this past week. Now, as we do, I'm going to read from a different version, a different translation. So if you're used to me using the NIV, this will be a little bit different. I'm going to use the message. The notes will be on your screen, so you can follow along in this translation. If you have a version app, you can follow along there. They have the message translation there. Or like I said, you can go to therescuechurch.com slash notes and follow along there. All right, let's get here to James chapter 4, verses 4 through 10. It says this, it says, You are cheating on God. If all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God in his way. And do you suppose that God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he is a fiercely jealous lover. And what he gives us is love far better than anything else 
you'll find. In common, it's common knowledge that God goes against the willful proud. God gives grace to the willing humble. So let God work his will in you. Yell aloud no to the devil and watch him scamper. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom and cry out. Cry your eyes out. The fun and games are over. Get serious, really serious. Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way to get on your feet. Let's pray. God in heaven, I'm thankful for the opportunity to connect today with this group of people that's joining us. God, I ask that right now you would just kind of quiet hearts, quiet my, my mind, that it would really be your word speaking through me, that we would be challenged and encouraged because of what your spirit does. Holy Spirit, be at work, I pray. I'm inviting you into this message today. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we get started here in the book of James chapter 4, we see, we see that James uses a, a symbolism of sorts of, of marriage. He, he talks about adultery and cheating. And unfortunately, you and I probably all know people who have gone through rough spells in their marriage. Unfortunately, there's, there's people who have cheated on their spouse. They have someone that they're married to, that they're committed to, that they, they have promised before God and before that person and probably before some friends that they are going to stay loyal till this person, till death do they part. But then, then things happen. It can be a variety of different things. Often it's an a unknown, unintentional, slow slide into this, this bad space. And that bad space is is on occasion with coworkers. On occasion, it's just with that person that they randomly meet while you're out. Often, it's because you put yourself in a situation that you didn't even realize was a bad situation, but, but you didn't have guardrails up to ensure you didn't end up there. And in those situations, you find yourself as a married individual with another person, married or not, you found yourself connecting and finding that that they had something to to offer you that you really weren't seeing that you were getting in your spouse. And maybe you were telling yourself a lie that said that this person cares more about me than my spouse does. And maybe there was a lie that, that this person is what's right for me, my spouse isn't. Our mind plays tricks on us. Satan gets in, slides in those lies, and convinces us it's okay. And, And then... It may start with, with just innocent conversation, some chats on the phone or through text messages or through a messaging app. It may be at work in a break room or as things go right now through Zoom calls or, or something like that. But somehow you just start to connect with this, this person that's not your spouse. And before you know it, you and that person have connected in a way that is meant only for you and your spouse. You may not, you may not have had a, a sexual, intimate relationship with that person and connected that way, but that, that emotional connection that's meant for you and your husband or you and your wife has now translated to this other person. You have had an affair. You whether intentionally or not, whether premeditated or not, you have slipped into a dangerous spot and have ended up in an affair. Now, now the reality is the Bible is very clear that there's absolutely nothing wrong with being single and being by yourself. It's very clear about that. And it's very clear that at the same time, there's nothing wrong with being married. In fact, it says that there, there's good in it and that there's a connection and that the two become one and are joined together. But it's also very clear that while both of those are okay, the middle ground of that affair is not. In our passage in James today, James says, you are cheating on God. You are cheating on God. He is accusing those Jewish Christians of of kind of 
saying, hey, I know I'm committed to you, God. I know you are my Savior. I know that you, Jesus, and, and they would have been not very far removed from Jesus' death and resurrection. They, he's saying, I, I know that you at one point committed to Jesus and realized that he was the only way to heaven. You realize there was a new covenant because of Jesus' blood on the cross that you could have a relationship with him. And you were following him and you were serving him as you were spread out, as you were dispersed among the known world as Jewish Christians, you were still committed to this, this God of the universe who you knew to be God of the universe. But now, now as you've gotten out, as you've been living life, as you've been around other people, you kind of started to slip. He's telling them that, that you started to slip into a, a, a bad spot in the middle. That spot where I'm not, I'm not fully committed to God, but at the same point, I, I, I'm not lost and headed to hell. I'm in a, in a middle spot where I want what God has to offer. I want his saving grace. I want his forgiveness. I want all that. But I've, I've somehow turned and, and kind of deafened that ear to that Holy Spirit prompting. Over time, and it doesn't happen immediately, just like it doesn't happen immediately in a marriage most of the time. Over time, I've just kind of slipped. And at first, it's probably something small, maybe not even something wrong, but I've put myself in a situation. And now I've started to see, I've started to see that, that there's this thing that I, I want. Maybe it's power. Maybe it's a good reputation. Maybe the fact, we, we talked a while ago about how Jewish Christians were kind of seen as the lowest of the low. Maybe they, they've kind of slipped into that spot where they're like, man, I'm sick of being the lowest of the low. I want a chance to be known. I want to be respected. And so now I've, I've kind of moved into that, that middle of saying, well, it's okay to do this to get a little bit of respect. And maybe I don't need to be at... at gathering with my local church on Sunday. And maybe I don't need to be gathering with my local church during the week. And maybe, maybe I don't need to be connecting with God on a daily basis. And as one thing leads to another, leads to another, they lead to that spot in the middle where I've now compromised on my faith. And as James puts it, I've cheated on God. This, this analogy that James uses reminded me of, of another passage that, that comes to mind. It's a passage in the book of Revelation. And we don't hear a lot of sermons probably from the book of Revelation, but there's some really good stuff there and some real lessons that we can take and we can apply to our lives. I love a lot of what's in the, the first four chapters of Revelation as, as a challenge to us. And I'm going to direct you there. We're going to go through some, some of the verses in Revelation chapter 3. And in fact, why don't I just read those right now? This is, so just to give a little background on Revelation so you kind of have an idea of what's going on here. John, the Apostle John, is out on this island by himself. He has, because of his faith, because of what he's teaching, because of what he's preaching, they tried to execute him. It didn't work. He didn't die. So then comes this idea of, well, if we can't kill him, if for some reason God has chosen to protect him so we can't kill him, or, or who knows how they explained his inability to be killed, let's put him out on this island called Patmos all by himself because then at least he can't be influencing people with the gospel. He can't be influencing people to believe in Jesus. So they do that. They stick him on this island of Patmos, and while there, Jesus appears to John. And as Jesus is appearing to John, he says, hey, I've got a message for you. I want you to capture all this information. So these are actually Jesus' words that he's given to John that he wants John to communicate eventually to the people. He originally no, but then as time goes, he's supposed to communicate it. Anyway, the words go like this. It's in Revelation 3, 14 to 18. It says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write... These are the words of the Amen, 
the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are a wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and wear and white with white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. In this, the, the illustration that God chooses to use, he's gone from that of adultery to that of being lukewarm. He, he's pulled out this this new example for, for people who are reading Scripture and for us today. And in this example of being lukewarm, it would have really made sense to this church at Laodicea who, who he was talking to. You see, the church in Laodicea was familiar with lukewarm. It would have, it would have hit home to them. The church in Laodicea was in an area that was profitable. God had, had allowed them to be blessed they were known for a number of things that, that allowed them to be wealthy. One of the things was, was actually their, their, as I understand it, like an eye doctor, eye treatment place in Laodicea. They had created, it sounds like a salve of some sort that people wanted, that people would come to. So now the people in Laodicea are doing well. And it sounds like from this passage, we can, we can hear that, that the Christians that are in Laodicea are doing well also. And they've seen themselves be blessed. They've seen things go well. They're doing well financially. They have some of the great medical advances. They have great clothes to wear. Kind of sounds a little bit of like, like many of us in the U.S. we got a lot of things going for us. And in the church in the U.S., the same thing can be said. We as Christians have a lot going for us. And the reason lukewarm would have translated well was as much as that community of Laodicea had going for them, there was one thing that they did not have going for them, and it was their water. You see, they, they didn't have a great water supply. That's right, the community had everything else financially and medically and all of this stuff, but they didn't have a great water supply. So, so engineers created an aqueduct to bring water in, so they would have a consistent, reliable water source. Now, the reality of this, this water source, though, was that by the time the water got to them, it was pretty lukewarm. There, it wasn't something that was refreshing or energizing. It wasn't something hot that was relaxing and, and you could just take a bath in and feel good. No, it was just lukewarm. And... And in this lukewarm situation where Jesus is challenging them, these people would have known that there was also hot and cold because the reality was there was a, another community. There was, there was Heropolis. Heropolis was known for their hot springs, places where you could take warm, relaxing baths or, or kind of like the hot tub thing and just relax. And then, then there was another community, there was Colossae, and Colossae was known for their springs of cold, refreshing water that they had. And in this cool, refreshing water, they would have been able to, to drink it and just feel refreshed. But the one thing that they did not have in Laodicea was either hot water or cold water. They had it in the middle. And Jesus uses that analogy to say, you are neither hot nor cold, you are lukewarm. I wish, he says, I wish that you were either hot or cold. So let's take a look at, at what cold is and, and kind of work through a, a description of what it means to be cold. I just put a few notes down for myself as I was thinking about this. And when we think of cold in the relationship to, to my relationship with Jesus, what would that look like? A cold person would be that person most likely that just doesn't have a relationship with God. They're that person that hasn't come to a point 
where they've acknowledged that they are sinners headed for hell and that they need a savior. They're at that point in their life where, where they're living life, enjoying it, thinking all is good, or maybe, maybe thinking all is bad, but they're just they're, they're living a life separate from God. They don't have the convictions that go with, with being a follower of Christ. They don't have the Holy Spirit living in them, challenging them on a daily basis to, to, to live for him. They also, though, while they don't have that Holy Spirit in there challenging them to live better, they don't have the Holy Spirit inside them comforting and encouraging and providing. They may not realize it, but they're living away from all that is good. But even in that situation, even in this comparison, God, Jesus specifically, sorry about that with my mic, All right, Jesus specifically, even in that situation, Jesus says to them, I would prefer church in Laodicea. I would prefer you were either hot or cold. He tells them, rather than being in the middle ground where they're at right now, he prefer that they were cold. Rather than saying that they, they follow him, rather than saying they have a relationship with him and that they love him and that he is God, but not living like it, he would prefer they were over here in the cold area. And right now, if you're connecting with us, if you're with us today and you're connecting with us today and you're saying, hey, Sam, Sam, I, I'm in that cold area. I'm in that area where I, I haven't yet chosen to follow Jesus. I haven't yet chosen that I even want to be a Christian. In fact, some of the reason I don't even want to be a Christian is because I see those people that you're talking about who say they believe one thing and they live right in the middle, and so I'm not sure that I even want to be a part of that. Let me just tell you, if you are one of those people that says, I'm in that cold area where I am not a follower of Christ and I know it, let me just say welcome. I am super thankful that you are choosing to be with us today. I'm thankful that you're at least willing to consider for whatever reason. Maybe it's to make a friend happy. Maybe it's to make a, a relative happy. Maybe it's just because you're, you're questioning something. Or maybe it's because you've heard about the Rescue Church and you want to know what the Rescue Church is all about. But for whatever reason you're connecting with us today, I want to say thank you. Thanks for being with us. Know that you are loved. You do not have to be a follower of Christ for us to love you where you're at. And so thanks for being with us, and thanks for being a part of this. Hopefully, hopefully there's some part of this that will encourage you as well. Now, now maybe, maybe you're in that lukewarm spot that we were talking about, where you're dabbling in sin, where, where you've decided to think you're self-sufficient, where you've decided that, that, you know what, I don't know if I, I mean, yes, God exists and I love him, but I don't need him every day. Now, you may not have verbalized that. You may say, no, that's not how I feel. But have you walked through your day today without taking time to pray and talk to him? Have you walked through your day without seeing the blessings that he's put in front of you? Have you walked through your day without feeling that prompting of the Holy Spirit to live for him? Let's go past today. Let's look back at, at this past week. Have you been in your Bible? Have you been reading your Bible? Have you been praying? Have you been growing in your faith? Do you believe that God is the one that's going to provide for you? Or do you believe that it really it's all on your shoulders? That really it's all about me and how hard I work? It's really because I live in the U.S. of A that I have what I have and Thank God I'm an American. But yet you've forgotten maybe that, that, that really who's providing for you is not somebody in Washington, D.C. It's not somebody in your state capitol. It's not those people who laid down their lives and we're super thankful for them. Super thankful for those who have laid down their lives so that we could have the freedoms we do. But have we forgotten the God that allowed you to be born in this country where you have those freedoms? Have you forgotten the God that's given you the ability to work so that you can earn that paycheck? Have you forgotten the God, or maybe not even forgotten, minimized the role that 
God in heaven has played in where you're at today? Is church that thing that you do to check off something on a box? In fact, in fact, you might be one of the many people in the good old U.S. of A. or in the world right now who is, is slowly slipping away from church. You're slipping away from church because in the middle of this COVID pandemic, which has forced us to, to be remote distance, remote learning, remote everything else, including church, it's made it easy for you to kind of disconnect. You've got that slow fade that's pulling you away from that strong relationship you once had with Jesus. Is that where you're at today? Now I hope, I hope where you're at is that hot spot. That hot spot where, where you are connected with God, where, where you and God are like this. Where it, it's something that often Christians experience shortly after they come to a relationship with Jesus. It's that thing where, where I know that I want to be closely connected to him. I want to hear him. I'm noticing the little things that he does in my life. I'm noticing the fact that, that I just missed being in an accident. And I thank God that I was running 20 seconds behind from work because I just drove by this massive accident. Is it, is it that, that hot spot where, where not only do you say, you know what, I'm going to be in church on Sunday where people notice that I'm at, where people see that I'm living for Christ and see it, no, no, you're saying, you know what? Even when people don't see it, I'm going to be on my Bible or in my Bible. I'm going to be on my knees, literally or figuratively, in prayer, talking to God. I am going to work at, at being intentional about praying continually because I want to be more and more like Him. I, as much as I want to have that new house, that new car. As much as I believe that God blesses me, I'm not going to work to do it all in my power. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to ask him that he would bless me and that he would make it happen. And I'm going to, going to follow and follow hard after him. Are you in that spot where you're hearing the Holy Spirit's prompting? Where you're being convicted, where you're being encouraged. The reality is that when, when you're in that spot where you're hot, where, you're, where you and God are connected, where, where all is, is feeling like it's well in the world, no matter how bad things go, it's still okay. In those seasons, you tend to just feel and experience that comfort of the Holy Spirit, God living in you. It's the, God, it's the fact that God is living in you that empowers you to do and say the things that you do and say. The reason you've been excited and people see, see God in you is because God is literally in you and working in you and through you because you're hot. And yet we go back to this, this word that Jesus has for the church at Laodicea where he's... He's lamenting them. He's imploring them, don't be hot. Don't be, don't be lukewarm. Be hot where you're all in with me or be cold where, where you're yet at a point where you, you know that you need me. But don't be in the middle trying to have a little bit of both. Don't be in the middle where you're trying to please the world and you're trying to please God because no person can have two masters. We're told that you will either love one and hate the other or you will... Despise one and love the other. It's, it's a paradigm. You cannot love God and the things of this world. It just doesn't work. And those of us that are trying to do that are at that lukewarm place. And I pray right now that there is a Holy Spirit that is inside of you, that is convicting you, that is telling you where you're at. That is showing you right now where you are at. As I, was, as I was thinking about today and what it looks like to be hot or cold, I was thinking about that, that awful, lukewarm middle. 
it reminded me of, of coffee. And I don't know, maybe I was just really craving, craving coffee at that point. I don't know what it was, but there's, there is nothing like an ice cold iced coffee on a hot day. It's refreshing, it's enjoyable. For those of you who like coffee, it's, it's enjoyable. It's a, it's a good thing. There's, and I have this thing that one of my kids got me, and I absolutely love it. It keeps my coffee warm literally for hours and hours. And I don't just mean a little warm, I mean like hot. And so there's that time where I just want a nice hot coffee. But I don't know that I have ever... No, let me rephrase that. I know that I have absolutely never said that I want this one in the middle. That I want this, this lukewarm coffee. It's not hot. It's not hot. It's, it's not cold. It's just kind of there. In fact, in fact, it's part of why I'm thankful I have this here to keep my coffee hot because because I had some of that lukewarm coffee. And if you have cream and, and stuff in your coffee like I do, I, I can't do the black coffee thing. As it starts to get lukewarm, it kind of starts to get, I don't know, separated, lumpy. I, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just, it gets a different texture when a hot coffee becomes a lukewarm coffee. Now, this isn't all about coffee, but I hope you get the point that that no one wants a lukewarm coffee. It's not good really for anything. It's not good for anything unless it becomes hot or becomes cold. When it's in the middle, it's worthless. Christian, if you are at a point, if you can truly examine yourself today, and you're not at a point where, where you're over here connected with God, where the Holy Spirit has worked in you, that you are loving others like He does, that He's worked through you, that you want to serve others like He did, where you want to know Him more. If you're not at this point, if you're not at this point of, of being connected so deeply, closely to God, then be honest with yourself with where you are at which is most likely most likely right here in the lukewarm middle where Jesus' words are, I would want to spit you out of my mouth. Where are you at today? I mentioned sports earlier. I love sports. We in this country love our sports. In fact, internationally people love sports, whether it's American football or European football or baseball, or cricket, or whatever it is. We love our sports. So if you're thinking of the sports analogy, if you're like, I'm not a coffee guy, I don't get it, look at it this way. Are you somebody that is all in with your sports team? Or are you that fair weather fan that's right down the middle that if it's convenient, you'll be at the game, or watch it on TV? If it's convenient, you'll cheer. If it's convenient, if it's convenient, or, or if you're losing, using the sports analogy, maybe you're over here where you could care less about sports, and that's fine. At least you're not pretending it. At least you're not faking that you love football when you really don't. It's possible to drift from this place of being a, a fan, a super fan, into this middle. I told you earlier that I love football and really enjoy watching it, which is true. I also told you about being a fan of New England for years and years. Also true. We're going on 30 years of cheering for them. But, but I can tell you, at one point I was probably more over here. And then, through circumstances, circumstances like moving away from New England, circumstances like surrounding myself with people who didn't love New England, circumstances like 
other things in life getting busy and taking me away from the, the time to watch football and stay on top of who is where and what and what's going on. Over the years, I probably have gone really more into this, this middle piece. No longer am I at that point where on Sundays, without DVR or without any of that, I would be intentional about being in front of a TV watching the, the Patriots play. Even though they were, I think the first year I cheered for them, I think they were 1-15. in 15. And now I've kind of drifted into this spot where I'll see a handful of games a year. I, I still cheer for them. I can still tell you about what's going on on the team, but I'm not completely plugged in like a hardcore Patriots pa fan likely would be. Is that what your faith is like? Is that where you are at today? Have you gone from being all in to kind of life's happened, things are going on, and without even realizing it, not intentionally, you didn't intentionally say, oh, I'm going to just go to the middle. You just kind of have ended up there. Like that spouse who drifted into that affair. You just ended up there. We're going we're gonna to wrap up here. And as we do, I want you to self-evaluate. I want you to self-evaluate where you're at. We're going to have a moment of silence before, before I pray for you to have a little bit of time to pray yourself. And then after that, we'll connect and we'll, we'll talk about some other stuff. But, but we're going to have that time here in just a little bit. Before I get to that, I want to ask those of us who are a part of the Rescue Church, those of us who call the Rescue Church our home, I want to ask you about it. See, the reality is God wants us to be all in. God wants me to be all in. He wants you to be all in in our relationship with Him. God wants me to be all in. And He wants the Rescue Church to be all in, following Him wherever He leads, even if it doesn't make sense to our community and to the other churches around. He wants us to be all in. So I want to ask you that are a part of the Rescue Church, to think about the Rescue Church as a whole, not just, not just the online campus if you're on there, not just the Moody County Flandreau campus if you're here, not just the Peoria Deaf campus if you're in Peoria, or the Deeside campus if you're in Deeside, but the Rescue Church as a whole, if we ask ourselves these questions, if we ask ourselves, Rescue Church, and let me be clear, when I say Rescue Church, I'm not talking about the buildings. I'm talking about the people. Because the buildings are just that. They're buildings that we meet in. They're tools that we have. The church is the people. And so rescue church. People. People that are connecting with us today. People. Are we, as the rescue church, are we at the spot over here where we're cold, where we're totally not following God, where we're off doing our own thing, that has nothing to do with Him. We have gone from not preaching the truth of the Gospel, the truth of the Bible, to, to that spot there where we're cold. That's where we're at. We are not preaching truth. We are not living truth. We are not modeling truth. We have given up on our vision and our mission of impacting our community so people know Jesus, grow in faith, go serve others. Are we, are we there? Or are we over here? Where we're hot? Where we are... We are shining the light of Jesus into all our communities. We are making an impact. Or are we in the middle? Are we, church, have we drifted into the middle? Where we're just going through and doing life, we are not making an impact. We are not as individuals reaching our communities. We are not as individuals serving in our communities. We are not as, as a church serving our community. We are not as a church impacting our community. We are not as a church growing in our faith. Church, where are we at? I just want you to think about that as well because just like God wants you and me to be all in, He wants us as a church to be all in. Now, if we've gotten to this point in the message and, and you're one of those people that I had talked to earlier who, who's in that, that cold spot, and like I said, we love you. We're thankful you're here. Please don't feel any pressure that, that's coming from me. 
If you're feeling any, I hope it's the Holy Spirit working inside of you and not me making you feel guilty. But if, you're, if you are that person that's in that cold spot, if that's you, there is no time like the present to go from cold to hot. There is no time like the present to acknowledge that you are a sinner. You in and of yourself cannot get yourself to heaven. Only God can do that. Only through His Son's death on the cross. And if that's where you're at today, I would implore you, there is no time like now to, to wherever you're at, say, God, I need you. God, I don't want to be cold. I want to be hot. I want to be on fire for you. I want to know what it means to have a relationship with you. God, save me from my sins. Forgive me from them. You don't have to use those words. Just let him know that you want a relationship with him and that you know you need him. Accept his gift today. With that said, we're going to have a moment of silence. I want you to truly, truly self-examine and see where you're at today. God in heaven, right now, I pray that it's your spirit moving in lives. That you're helping us be honest with ourselves, with where we are at as individuals. That I would be, would be honest with myself. That each of these people that are, are joining us today would be honest with themselves. And God, as a church, God, as, uh, as the person that you have allowed to be the leader of this church, that you've called to this spot. God, I am in front of all of these people saying, we do not want to be a lukewarm church. We certainly don't want to be a cold church either. God, we want to be hot on fire for you. God, light a fire in us that we would be a church that truly impacts our communities so people know Jesus, grow in their faith, and go serve others. God, be at work in our lives today and in our ministry and in our church In us as Christians, be at work today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in to the Rescue Church's past messages. To hear our messages live, head to one of our physical campuses. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com.